Hi, if you don't know me, my name is Sarah, and if you do know me, my name is still Sarah. We're off to a really good start here. I am here to talk about a very important topic, which is that of Christian contemporary worship music and how they fuel the growth of megachurches in the 21st century. Before I get into that, there's probably some disclaimers I need to put out there. The first thing is this, I am not a YouTuber, I'm a student, as you can probably tell with my surroundings. So editing, lighting temperature, continuity, not really my forte at this point. So just please be patient with that. Secondly, this is not going to be an all encompassing review. I am an undergraduate student, not even a PhD student, and there's a lot more research that needs to be done into commercialization of music and spiritual growth in America. Even today, when I discuss this, I'm going to be talking about a subset of worship music, which is that quasi-Protestant, megachurch-esque, white, primarily white music. Um, so please keep that in mind. There's a ton of things that need to be talked about within this topic and maybe I'll get to research those in the future, but for now this is what we're going with. That being said, I do believe I have the life experiences that allow me to be qualified to talk on the subject. First of all, I'm a musician. I've been playing in church bands like this kind of music since I was 13, so it's been a while. Um, second of all, I'm a Christian, so I understand the theology behind it, the intentions behind this music, and when I talk about this, I'm going to be coming at it from a sense of care, because this is a big part of my life as well. And third, I'm a student, which means that I'm going to be taking an academic and largely objective view at this. So yeah, it may not be quite the scathing review of CCM you're looking for. It may not also be the total all praising review of CCM that you're looking for. So we're gonna try to find ourselves somewhere in the middle of that. Folks, I feel like Curtis Connor definitely has a copyright on that or something. Um, let's just get into it, shall we? <laughs> So the first thing we need to define is what Christian contemporary worship music is in the context of this video. John Linton Baum, in his 2012 study of spiritual music, defines CCM as this. Christian contemporary music, or CCM, is a catch-all term for popular music that features evangelical Christian lyrics. It expresses the evangelical tenets of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, a duty to spread the gospel, and biblical inerrancy. Eric Rock has a really, really great video about the different types of Christian music that I'll link in the description, but I'm gonna steal the Venn diagram that he had in his video. What I can tell you right now is we are not gonna be talking about hymns today. I feel like I'm not in the wrong when I say that hymns have a certain sound to them. They're often more musically complex. They focus more on theology and quoting directly from the Bible, and they're considered traditional, older maybe, and to be completely honest, they are older, so that makes sense. Another thing we will be talking about is the genre of CCM, outside of CCM worship, which consists of those songs that you hear usually on K-Love, on WGTS 91.9, 95.1 China FM, all of those sort of radio stations, such as Brit Nicole, Casting Crowns, Mercy Me, all of those sort of bands. I am not gonna be including them in my analysis here. So what am I even talking about when I say Christian contemporary worship music? Well, there's two different types. I'll go back to the diagram for this. There's a vertical worship where we're talking directly to God, saying you are powerful, you are light, you are love. And then horizontal worship where we're talking about our surroundings or talking about ourselves and how they reflect God's love or how they're affected by God. Secondly, I'm gonna be focusing on CCM after 2000. The pre-2000s when you have people like Don Moen, like Petra, um, that version of worship was very different and I think should be classified separately. So we're talking about songs from huge worship collectives like Passion, like Hillsong, Hillsong United, Elevation Worship, that sort of genre. And what those worship collectives result in are these huge maximalist pieces, which you may not have thought of CCM worship like that, but that's what they are. There are thousands upon thousands of layered tracks, of pads, of synths, of electric guitars, often multiple drummers with multiple drum sets, things like that, that create these huge pieces that come together to form sort of this ambient, very processed and polished alt rock. 
that is not a diss, by the way, that has its places and its purposes that we'll talk about later. But that's usually what it ends up sounding like. So let's talk about the churches that actually spawn these huge worship collectives. <laughs> Now, the term megachurch refers to any spiritual body that has more than 2,000 regular attendees every week. Now, if you get over 10,000, you get the term gigachurch, which I don't really know why I like that, but I do. Let me read off the top five megachurches in the U.S. The first is Life.Church, which is pastored by Craig Groeschel. You may have heard of them because they're the ones that formulated the YouVersion Bible app, which is huge. So... Likewise, they have a weekly attendance of 100,000 people every week. That is insane. For a place in Edmond, Oklahoma, that is still really crazy to me. Next, we have King's Cathedral and Chapel, which is in Hawaii. It's an Assemblies of God church that has 70,000 people every week. Oh my goodness. And then we have Lakewood Church in third, pastored by Joel Osteen in Houston which is not denominational with 52,800 people on average every week. Then we have Church of the Highlands in Birmingham, Alabama, 52,000, and Crossroads Church of Cincinnati, pastored by Brian Tome, which has 38,000 people every week. Just to put that further into context for you, the largest NFL stadium is MetLife Stadium, which is home to the New York Giants and the New York Jets, and they have a seating capacity of 82,500 people. So imagine that if you, for example, if you go to life.church, every single seat is full and there's still people waiting outside, around 20,000, so a quarter more. That is insane. That is insane how large that is. Just knocking off some more well-known ones, North Point Community Church is pastored by Andy Stanley, has 38,000 people. Elevation Church, pastored by Stephen Furtick, has 35,000 people every week. McLean Bible Church in Virginia with David Platt has 16,500. And Passion City Church with Louis Giglio has a measly 5,000. Let me be clear, that is a huge amount of people and the fact that it seems so small compared to the other churches is insane. It is actually insane to think about how large these churches are. My hometown of Middletown, Maryland during the 2010 census had just over 4,000 people. And you're saying to me that there's a church out there that's 25 times the size of that every week? That's not even counting like people who come in maybe once a month or people that are just like not attending the services, but other things. 25 times. <laughs> wow. So let's listen to two songs that I really believe embody a lot of what the genre is today. The first is Hosanna by Hillsong United, and it came out in 2007, which is a while ago. However, this is really important. This entire album, in fact, was really important to the CCM genre and how it would grow in the future. During this time, Hillsong was just starting to find its sound, and a lot of that came from the fact that it had another campus that was making music called Hillsong London. And I'm wondering, where is Hillsong London now? And the fact is, it's it's gone. Um, not the campus and the church, but the music side of it has been eradicated by Hillsong, actually, because they wanted to present a more united... <laughs> a more united front. However, Hillsong London really contributed to the Hillsong sound that we know and love because they really drew influences from that London punk alt-rock scene that was really flourishing at that time. So the song starts with this really clean guitar riff. It's chilling and pure and cold. most iconic guitar lines I would say in Christian contemporary worship music. However, it also harkens back to some more secular hits. We have songs like No Surprises by Radiohead. also 
also very reminiscent of some early Coldplay stuff, talking about Yellow Album, A Rush of Blood to the Head era. And it's very interesting because as Coldplay would get more into layering on albums like Viva La Vida or Death and All His Friends and Milo Zyloto and Ghost Stories, Hillsong United was doing the same thing on tracks like Like an Avalanche. Pretty much the entire Zion album. smash hit of the worship world so will I Again, we're finding those moments of intense maximalism from all these layered pads and ambient sounds that are creating this worship experience that we call Christian contemporary worship music. Enter Glorious Day by Passion. Now Passion is really interesting because a lot of their music is catered towards a participatory style because of how their megachurch is actually structured and how they have a convention every single year. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn Till I made I was breathing the night Alive. All my failures I tried to hide It was my dream yeah. Till I made You come already hear, there are these long gaps that are within the melodic line, which is interesting because hymns in the past were notably dense and didn't have gaps like this. What this means is that it's becoming less about the lyrics in this song and more about the instrumentation and the experience that instrumentation gives you. You can also hear those multiple layers of pads and guitars especially here. Even though it starts off with just the acoustic guitar, as soon as the beat drops and we hear that bass and everyone comes in, all those layers stack up. Now I know I said that I was mostly going to be talking about white-centered CCM worship. However, I'm going to take a little exception to that because Glorious Day has a version pioneered by All Nations Church, which is a historically black church, and they do things a little differently. Let's look at the second verse of that real quick. Now your mercy.
version feel markedly different is this call and response vibe we have going on here, which separates it from sort of the white mediated CCM music because it harkens back to the oral traditions that are a big part of gospel, of spirituals, of things that are historically part of the black church. Call and response is a very common trait to hear there, and we see that here as able to meld the original white-centered version into something that is more recognizable to their culture. Now, I want to talk a little more specifically about passion because I think that the way it operates is very important to how Christian contemporary worship music has gone back into smaller churches and fueled the growth of large mega churches as kids age out. Christian Stanfield did an interview in March 2021 talking about his songwriting process because every single year they put out new songs at their National Passion Conference, which happens usually in Atlanta or sometimes in other places. In reference to one of the songs that he wrote, he says, he wrote it to give these students a song to sing that would lift their eyes up to a God who is all powerful and can do anything, a song of faith to sing in that moment. So as you can already tell, it's a very experienced based music. So I know we've been talking a lot about sort of the nitty gritty aspects of the music. However, I think it's also really important to consider the fact that this is not just, you know, hearing music and integrating it into you. It's also about the theology behind it. What are you indoctrinating people with? And also the feeling and the passion, no pun intended, that students have when they come to a conference like this and they want to experience God on a more spiritual level. Especially in an individualist society like America, this is becoming more and more about the personal journey and the personal experience and not about the general community consensus. So when you have those large spaces where it's just ambient music playing or a strumming guitar, or maybe even like a, a worship leader singing oh for like 15 billion measures, what it's doing is it's giving you that space to form your own personal opinion and spiritual experience. And I think that's really important in how Passion and many other worship collectives write their music. Okay, let's get into why you're probably here, which is how does CCM affect the growth of megachurches? To this I hope, my hope is only Jesus. In order to understand that, we need to go way back into thinking about the convention experience. So even small churches usually have some kind of national conference growing up, which isn't really a foreign concept, even outside of the spiritual world. For example, I went to Grace Community Church of Frederick. Every summer, a group of kids from our youth group would pile onto a bus and head down to the Midwest, usually Illinois, Ohio, Indiana, to a college campus where we would have Momentum or Momentum Conference. Um, which was held by CE National, which is the headquarters of the Brethren Churches of America. And when I say it was always amazing, it was always amazing. We used to hashtag it on social media, hashtag best week of summer. And you know what? It was true. It was true. I mean, when you go there, you're getting that mix of intense bonding with whoever is going with you. You have the amazing worship by really talented musicians. You have the lights, the set, the props, the amazing speaker that you've just heard of, but now you get to see live. And on top of all of that, you get to experience not only a walkable community like a college campus, but you also get to be in a large group of committed believers. And that's not something you really get to see back home usually. And what it leads to is this intense spiritual high where you feel like you can do anything. You come back home repurposed, rejuvenated, refueled. You wanna spread the gospel. You wanna live out what God is saying. You want to be the best Christian you can be. And it all comes from that experience. Now, while a lot of those happen, usually in middle and high school, they do continue into young adulthood, particularly with conferences like Urbana and Passion Conference. I actually went to Passion Conference in 2020, you know, right before everything shut down. And it was very interesting because it gave me those same sort of vibes as I had gotten with Momentum in middle and high school, because we were all just there to worship. We were all there to learn. And while there really wasn't much extracurricular activity going on with passion, because we were all adults at that point, I still felt that spiritual high. It was really great, you know, hearing everyone singing along to the worship, seeing the crowd of faces as we were in Mercedes-Benz Stadium in Atlanta, which is huge. 
It was really, really, honestly, mind-blowing and life-changing. So of course, when you have those intense spiritual experiences, you want to take that back home with you. You want to feel the same things you're feeling at the same intensity that you're feeling them. So what does that mean? Part of that is related to the fact that you feel completely in tune with God in that moment, that you spent so much time really just digging into his words and you still have that passion to go forward and to read his word and to grow in your faith journey. However, part of it is also you want to experience this convention-like things back home at church. And what does that mean? That means the huge group of believers around you. That means the glossy production with the set and the lights. And that means the really high quality music that comes from running a convention, a huge convention like Passion, like Urbana. They are simply able to do more because they have a large backing system, because they have, you know, stars like Chris Tomlin, like Christian Stanfill, like Chris Brown and Mac Brock and all those big names. They have the firepower and the resources. So of course the music is gonna be wonderful. But when you go back home and there's a bit of a culture shock because, you know, you're back to that old grandma playing piano and it's lovely, but it's just not the same. You have that yearning of, oh, I wish I wish I could go back to feel that spiritual high, to feel getting just swept up in his presence. And friends, that brings us to the business side of this entire music industry. As these large Christian music collectives began to release music that people wanted to come back and play in church, they realized quite quickly that there was a problem. The problem with recording music and selling it and offering it on streaming platforms even, means that it's your intellectual property, which means when other churches play it, there becomes the issue of copyright. So to get around that, CCLI was founded in 1988 by Howard Rachinsky, and CCLI stands for Christian Copyright licensing international and basically what it did is it created an easy way for musicians and publishers to get money for the music they were making while still keeping it mostly affordable for churches to use now as you can probably tell ccli totally changed the game because now you have churches smaller churches that are able to play this music and kids coming back from conventions who want to hear this music and are engaging more with it so because of that Small churches essentially became sort of large mega church worship collective cover bands. And with these cover bands came a new way of figuring out what music to play every week. It became less about the content and more about the popularity and thinking about what your audience would like to hear. If it's a younger audience, should I play some newer music? Things like that, which again, isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's good to cater your services to the audience you're giving it to. However, it did change things. In fact, when it came to that popularity, CCLI was directly affecting it because it created this new chart, a top 25 chart that worship songs would go on. And so as soon as you log on to CCLI or try to figure out like what's new from the brand, you'd see that top 25 chart and be like, oh my goodness, we gotta play those songs. And then on top of that, you have these churches that are able to utilize the music they're selling through CCLI to create a new revenue stream that's able to uphold these just massive operating budgets. And what does that mean? That means hiring staff, buying equipment that smaller churches are just not able to afford. So it keeps widening that gap and being a positive feedback loop on the fact that the, these mega churches are able to produce really, really good sounding music and well processed music at that. You had them buying drum sets over just cajones. You had them getting pads with main stage on them to layer instead of just a piano. You have technology like using in ears, like a, it's a concert. In addition, you can house really talented artists that would otherwise be in the music industry making music on their own and pay them a competitive salary and give them a home and give them an audience right there in your church. These mega churches with these worship collectives are able to just throw every resource they have at their music, whether it be new equipment, better musicians, what have you. Now let's go back for a second to the fact these smaller churches are becoming cover bands, these larger worship collectives. What does that mean? Well, when you sing the song that's made by a different church, you're essentially unifying a theology. You're saying that I believe what this song has to say. And this is a double-edged sword. On one hand, on the writer's side, 
what that meant was that you had to create a little bit more of a vague theology foundation behind your songs because you knew it was going to be applied to so many different environments. And that's where you get those large gaps in melodic line where you are able to create your own spiritual experience in those moments. That's where you get the oohs and the ahs and the ohs the lead singer sings instead of maybe those harder hitting theological concepts that we're so used to hearing in hymns. Overall, the vague theology and the accessibility of the music, since it's things that we hear sort of on the radio, it ends up fueling the church even more. Now, when I say vague theology, I know there's a negative connotation that it seems to have, but that's not necessarily the case. Using this quote-unquote vague theology, you're able to make spiritual experiences more accessible to people that may not have a background in Christianity or all the foundational knowledge that comes with understanding what hymns talk about and things like that. It's also able to very easily spiritualize secular spaces, spaces like coffee shops and libraries and work areas. They're able to very easily be spiritualized and for the message to be spread because these songs aren't necessarily broadcasting a severe outlook of God. It's very soft, very palatable, but it is critical to note the importance this has on the growth megachurches in America. I mean, think about it. You're a young adult. You come back from a convention where you had a really great time and you felt that spiritual high. You come back home and you hear those same songs and you get more familiar with the theology behind that convention and behind the megachurch that runs it. So when you go off to college in a metropolitan area, when you start a family, when you just wanna branch out and go to a different church than your parents go to, you're naturally drawn to those mega churches because one, they deliver on the convention experience every time. And two, you've become familiar with the theology behind it. You've been experiencing it for like the last few years at least. So it feels like home as soon as you walk in. And that's why these churches are able to grow so fast. So what have we learned? CCM worship music is a lot more complicated than people give it credit for. I know it may sound like your typical, super cold playified, over-processed alt rock. However, there's a lot of layering, a lot that goes into the process, and that makes it harder for smaller churches to replicate. But through things like conventions, like CCLI, you can bring that culture back home, and those small churches essentially become poster boards for why you should join a mega church later in life. And we see the growth of mega churches in parallel with things like the growth of social media and the growth of streaming platforms. I mean, in 1990, there were 350 registered mega churches in the US. In 2000, it was 600. And then in 2011, just 11 years later, it was 1600. Current estimates range from 2,400 to 4,800 because they genuinely do not know. There are too many to count. We've seen time and time again that young people are the ones that are creating trends, whether that be in music or just widely in culture. And it's the same thing here. The Christian megachurch scene has become smart about it. They have these conventions that cater to young people so that they're able to bring back all the trends and the theology and the music culture that comes with it. Now, before I wrap up, I do want to say something that's a new trend or a more recent trend, at least, in Christian contemporary worship music. And that's that idea of going back to more wordy, more theologically heavy lyrics. We see bands like City Alight, like Maverick City Music, bringing back more lyrically dense songs into the worship scene, and it's very interesting to see how they've been received so far. For the most part, it's been well, but also they haven't been as big as Hillsong or as Elevation Worship because there is that accessibility key missing. Because congregations are used to hearing those more Hillsong Elevation-esque works that are simpler and easier to sing and process, going back to how dense things used to be is proving to be a little bit difficult. But don't count them out just yet, because they are being welcomed very warmly by the Christian community, because they're going from spaces of big theology back to lyrics of substance, and it's it's new. Now, will that like be able to balance out the accessibility issues that have been created? Who's to say? But it's definitely something that's worth looking out for. Well, that's all I had to say. So thank you for watching. I appreciate that you made it this far. Leave a comment down below. Tell me if you agree, disagree, any opinions you may have. I do want to hear people's thoughts on this. And until then, God made you special and he loves you very much. 
Goodbye. <laughs> I'm really sorry, but I just, I cannot keep silent on this issue any longer. I really hope somebody understands what I'm saying, what I'm going through right now when I say this, but Stephen Furtick looks like the white version of Drake. I'm so...